Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, it's our pleasure to interview Mr. Sonny Liston, the heavyweight champion of the world. On September 26th of 1962, Sonny Liston won the title when he knocked out Floyd Patterson in two minutes and six seconds of the first round. The next time they met, on July 23rd of 1963, Liston proved that this victory was no accident when he again won by a first round knockout. Millions of words have been written about Liston's long reach and his devastating style. Here's the way one sports writer described the dramatic defeat that Patterson suffered the second time they met. Scarcely a half minute had elapsed when the pile driving Liston sent Patterson toppling to his knees with a vicious left hook and a teeth rattling right to the jaw. After regaining his feet, Patterson began a panic-like retreat, but Liston was on top of him, pummeling him with a series of terrific smashes to the body and a bone-crushing right to the jaw. Patterson then hit the deck. It was all over. The whole fight lasted two minutes and 10 seconds. Just four seconds more the first time they met. Will Cassius Clay be next? We'll hear from the heavyweight champion of the world right after this message. Welcome to our show on the spot, Sonny Liston. We appreciate you coming here for this interview. And as you know, this is the third time we have met before the television cameras. Right. There's once more than me and Patterson there. That's right. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't meet you under the same circumstances. Sonny, before we actually start talking about Cassius Clay and other questions I have in mind, how about demonstrating before the television viewers uh, some of the physical prowess that you have? Uh, would you put your hand alongside of mine and let's see, boy, my, my hand there is lost. Oh. Tell me, when you, uh, when you turn your hand this way, what can you hold without any trouble? I can pick up a basketball. A whole basketball. So a football would be easy or anything along that size. Yeah. What about your reach? Could you demonstrate your reach for us? If you want to, you can stand up. I know you've got a seven-foot reach, supposed to be the longest reach in the history of boxing. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that is long. I would think Cassius Clay's reach is about the same. Has, has Cassius got a seven-foot reach? Not my, Mine might be a little longer than One that. more thing before we get in Cassius Clay. What about doing this? All the boys like to see you do that. That's all muscle, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> Cassius, uh, I mean, Sonny, what about the fight with you and Cassius Clay? What's going to happen there? Well, I can say one thing. If they get the tickets for the theater two weeks early and go and sit in the movie, and when the fight starts, everybody be going out saying, well, he didn't keep us long, and they've been sitting there two weeks. <laughs> Well, just to interpret that right down the cases, uh, it can't end before the first round. There has to be something that happens. <laughs> now, you knocked out uh, Patterson two minutes and six seconds the first time you met, and two minutes and ten seconds the second time you met. Do you think that you'll dispose of Cassius Clay uh, before that? Well, a lot of people are talking about He's talking about, he's done all this talking. I think that he's done is talking to himself to trying to push himself in the ring with me. Trying to get up to his nerve, huh? <laughs> but would you care to predict, or do you think the fight will go beyond one round? Well, I can say it won't go over three. Won't go over three. What about all this talking that he's doing, these poems he's reciting, and he has one poem where he says he'll beat you in eight. Do those poems and all this talking disturb you in any way? No, the only thing would disturb me is if he'd be around the played round. That's the only thing. Yeah. Is there any real hard feelings between you and Cassius Clay, personally? Well, it isn't any with me. I may, I know that uh, it would be just like a guy coming in to stick you up. There's no hard feeling between you, but you've got something he wants. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's a very witty answer. Uh. So Sonny. you couldn't feel mad at the guy. He's probably hard up, but and you would like to keep what he come after. That's right. Do you think all these antics and poems are going to help stimulate the biggest gate in the history of boxing? Is that one good benefit of all his talking? Well, he been uh, been calling them right so far, except one, and uh, 
Everybody thinks that he's got it down pat. He didn't call it right with Doug Jones. No, I mean at the press conference, he said uh, he said at first he'll get him in six, and then he said he'd get him in four. He said six and four is ten. Eh? <laughs> That's how he justified the fight going the limit. You once said that Cassius Clay should be arrested for impersonating a fighter, which I know is just a wisecrack of yours. Uh, you still feel that way? Well, at the time, I couldn't say that because, it, you know, any time two heavyweights meet, anything could happen. I mean, but I think I'm the best man, and I think that I'm going to prove to the public that he should be arrested. <laughs> At least I'm going to try. Well, now, in proving that, uh, Sonny, uh, I presume you're going to take this fight as serious as any fight you've ever had. You're going to go into serious training for it? Well, I'm going to take this serious if I was fighting Joe Lewis and his friend. What are your plans for training? When do you go into heavy training for this fight? Well, two days after Christmas. December the 27th. Do uh, you know where the fight will be held? It sounds like it's going to be held in Las Vegas. Well, I just told Jack Nylon that uh, well, it's never the price is right. It could be a Cassius Clay's house as long as the price is right. You should walk in there with two television cameras and the <laughs> price is right, huh? How much of a gate do you think the fight will actually draw, counting receipts from television, people at ringside, and motion picture rights? Well, that's where a fighter loses a lot of fights. He worry about what the gate going to draw and not keeping his mind on the fighting. So what's the never draw? That's, I guess I'll get my share. But do you think it will be the biggest gate money-wise in the history of fighting? That's what the sports writers seem to think and people that are talking about it. Well, I hope so. I would like to see it be. Uh, what do you plan to do after you fight Cassius Clay? Well, I'm aiming to help him out with his palm so he can have a income, you know. <laughs> you want to see that he's taken care of first. <laughs> That's right. But do you have anything in mind after you dispose of that little assignment for yourself, or aren't you looking that far ahead? Well, I take one step at a time. Which this is no step. It's a half a step, I think. <laughs> this is just a slight gallop. Yeah. Sonny, what about the heavyweight picture in general? Uh, who do you see around that might be a worthy challenger to your crown uh, after you and Clay meet, and assuming that you uh, defeat Clay? Well, I think Terrell is about the third, I think. Who? Terrell. Terrell. I don't know where Matrim's standing now. Mitchum seems to be sliding down, doesn't he? He's sliding someplace. I don't know where he's down or up. <laughs> but uh, is the heavyweight division that devoid of good material where there's just you and Clay and Terrell and that's about well, it? Well, you mean to be saying Clay, you can just say it's me. Just you, <laughs> <that's> <laughs> it. you Leave Clay out. <laughs> we can forget about everybody else. Huh? How long do you expect to hold the heavyweight title? Well, as uh, long as I can. I want to retire undefeated, so I guess it's like uh, Joe Lewis said, that there's no heavyweights around now to, for me to prove how good I am, and I'd like to s prove it to myself. You mentioned uh, Joe Lewis. Uh, Mrs. Joe Lewis, uh, she's your attorney, is she not? Yes, she is. And uh, how long has she been your attorney? I said she's been my attorney about five months. She's going to handle all the legal affairs for this fight? Yes, she is. Sonny, are there any countries in the world that uh, you'd like to go on an, an exhibition tour, not only to fight the best that they have in those countries, but to see these different cities and countries? I would like to go to Japan, and they say that's the countries that you would like to see. Japan. I know you received a beautiful gift from President Lyndon B. Johnson when he was vice president. Uh, what did he give you, Sonny? He gave me a watch and a pair of cufflinks. How long ago was this? About, about six months. Well, now he is the president of the United States. Do you hope to see him again soon? Well, I'm looking forward to it. What was your impression of the assassination of President John Kennedy? What did you think of that? Well, it hits you just like someone in your family has gotten it. 
It was really a tragedy. You yes, couldn't sir. believe it at first. Mm. Greatest tragedy this country's known. Yes, it is. Did you ever meet President Kennedy? No, I never did. Uh, getting back to your bout with Cassius Clay, Sonny, uh, how much weight do you plan to lose between now and the time you step in the ring with him? About 15 pounds. 15. You think you'll have any trouble doing that? No, I don't think so. Well, now, what will be your fighting weight when you drop 15 pounds? About 210. And how tall are you? Six one and a half. What's your chest expansion? <laughs> I don't know. Last time it was 48. Could you uh, give us a little half a minute demonstration of inhaling and exhaling and show us your chest expansion? Just like you're going to take a deep breath. Right? I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, you have to know how to do that. A lot of, I don't know, I really haven't practiced on expanding my chest. It just comes natural. You don't specialize in that no. somatic purpose. Sonny, what's wrong with boxing today, in your opinion? Well, I think it's um, getting guys in it don't know anything about it. By guys, you mean fighters or managers? Managers. And you will lay all the ills of boxing on these managers that are not qualified or trained or yes, sir. not sincerely good managers? Well, in what respect uh, is that the foundation of what's wrong with it? Well, I would say a manager, as I tell uh, my manager and my trainer, uh, I tell them when the bell rang, I said, y'all the best duckers in the world. Y'all can stand out there and, and be ducking for me and never get hit. But I'm the only one going to get hit in there. And the manager don't feel it. So if the promoter would give him thousand dollars he would take a fight and which the fighter shouldn't be fighting a fighter like that is there anything else wrong with boxing besides uh, poor managers well I don't think it is I would say besides poor management everything is fine Sonny will return with our interview right after these messages Sonny, what can be done to cut down deaths in the ring? There was a wave of publicity in the press of this country over the last six or eight months in which uh, that was pointed up that it seemed that in recent years more fighters died in the ring than, than people expected. Well, I would say <coughs> uh, different, like light heavyweights fighting heavyweights and uh, welterweights fighting middleweights. They're stepping out of their class because uh, each class gets more money than the lightweights and things like that. And they would do this to get more money. Sonny, we all know that the best fighter is a hungry fighter. Do you think that's one of the things wrong with boxing, that uh, the prosperity of this country is reduced, the opportunity and the desire of many people are forcing to become fighters? Well, I couldn't say, I don't think the fight, like, now if you take my record, I was brought up the right way. When I fought Foley here, I was number two. And uh, he was, he was number two. So they made me fight him and then they put him in my spot. I would just say, for instance, if I lose to Cassius Clay, I should be number one, and then fight the number two guy. And then if he beat me, it's going back down the steps. There's been a lot of mismatching is what you're saying. Right. Sonny, how long ago was it when you first sensed that you would become the heavyweight champion of the world? In your own mind. Well, when I felt it, when I fought Cleveland Williams in Miami. How long ago was that? About five years. Now, how did that fight and was it a knockout for you? Yes, it was. What round? Third round. Third round. Now, what made you think when you were through with that fight five years ago that you were the next champion? Well, the way he could hit and he punched hard, and after the, the fight, we went back in the dressing room, and all the reporters came in and said, now we believe you can take it. 
with uh, well, did that surprise you? It must have. Did you then say to yourself, well, here I've met one of the heaviest fighters of my time, and I've knocked him out, and that give you the confidence to make you feel you would be the champion of the world? Is that what went through your mind? Yes, it did. And then I looked at his record, and he had a string of knockouts. Before I fought him, I told him, and then I said to myself, I said, oh, these are nothing but setups. And after the first round, and I went back to my corner, and... Uh, I told my trainer, I said, they wasn't set up. So I said, he knocked these guys out. <laughs> so he said, you got to get in close on him. I said, either that, we got to get out of here. <laughs> because this guy is really something. So then I moved in close on him, and I won the fight in the third round with the knockout. Who would you consider to be the toughest fighter you've ever met in all the years you've been in the ring? Well, I would say Cleveland Williams and... Uh, I imagine you see the Foley fight. I think Foley's fight was one of my best fights. What was your easiest fight? <laughs> A lot of people think they're all easy, but they're not. They don't know what we have to go through to get in shape to win the fights in the first round. What are some of the things you have to go through? Well, you have to get up 5 o'clock in the morning, run about 5 or 6 miles. Come back and go to bed and, and get up there and go to the gym, do about 12 or 13 rounds of boxing and training, you know, hitting a heavy bag. A lot of preparation. In your two fights with Floyd Patterson, before that bell rang, because the bout didn't even reach the second round, did you feel in your own mind each time you were going to finish him in the first round? Yes, I did. In the second fight, I didn't think so because I felt that he was going to try to run. Well, did you feel that once you came close enough to connect that you'd finish him? Yes, I did. Is that because you feel that your punch is so powerful that he can't take it, or is it a combination of the two? Well, I feel that I can, anybody I hit, I can knock him out. You think Cassius Clay may get on his bicycle with you? I don't think he knows how. <laughs> you don't think he can pedal a bicycle? <laughs> no. You think he's going to try? Well, I, if he gets on his bike, I'm going to get on a motor scooter. <laughs> That's it. You're going to race him, huh? <laughs> Maybe Cassius Clay will be listening to the show. Uh, Sonny, is there anything that annoys you about being the heavyweight champion of the world? Anything that bothers you about it? Well, not, in, not anything bothers me yet. Are you happy with the way you're being treated by the press? Yeah, as long as they spell the name right. <laughs> <laughs> what about the public? You happy with the way the public is treating you and so forth? Yes, I am. Um, I remember Joe Lewis told me he fought uh, some guy in Philadelphia. And then after the fight, he drove down the streets and they throw rotten eggs and rock rocks and things at the car. I said, now, if anybody do that to a champ like he was, he can look for him to do the same for me. So it's somebody always not going to like you. I don't care how great you are. What about a fellow who has in mind entering the ring as a profession, Sonny? What would you tell him? Well, I would say that he has to live by have to live by the rules and cooperate by them, and he come out on top. It's all in the knowing how to live. What's the most important thing a fighter should have to be a success? Should he have a fighting heart or a heavy punch? Of course, he needs them both, but if he had only one or the other, which does he need most? Well, it's, it's hard to say about the heart. You know, a lot of fighters got a lot of heart, and uh, I guess you have to have a little skill with it, too. Getting back to that comment you made about managers a few moments ago on this broadcast in which you said uh, a good deal of the fault that lies with the boxing today are poor managers uh, and you indicated some of the managers would just sell the fighter out for a thousand dollars I think you said or whatever the amount is is that uh, more common today than it has been in the last 10 years prior to this well excuse me I couldn't say it because uh, when I was in St. Louis I had this manager and uh, Johnny Summerlin, he was from Detroit, and we was driving up to Detroit to fight, so I didn't know who I was going to fight. 
And so we get almost there. I says, who's fighting the main event? And then he tells me, you are. It's the first you heard of it. Yeah. And then after we get up there and I beat him, he picks up the paper the next day. They want to know what Summerlin offer was I just that good. It was supposed to have been a, I suppose it have been, a, I guess, a duck for him or something. So and they rematched us. And then I beat him easily the second time because I know what I had to go up against. And then I did the first time. And the fight that I lost in the only fight that I ever lost was in Detroit. And I still had these same managers. They sent me up on the train and told me they was coming the next day on the plane. So when I get ready to go in the ring, I don't see nobody. I had to go down inside the ring and just give me somebody to go in the corner and take my mouthpiece out. See, and it was a manager that had his heart in a fighter would be better. Sonny, what do you attribute the tremendous force that you pack in your fists? Is it due to good conscientious training and the fact you were born with this power, or have you developed that brutal strength right in your fists through some other way? You know, I guess a uh, few things I picked up from Joe Lewis. And I remember reading a book about him. He says, uh, don't hit at your target. So I always try to hit through it. And when you do that, I develop a good left hand from that. Don't hit at your target, hit through it. Try to punch through it. Now, uh, what did you do to apply that? How did you adopt that outside of saying that to yourself? Well, I go out and I try to punch through it. <laughs> Just as simple as that. Well, you're able to go right through them. In fact, uh, that seems to be the common practice uh. with you now. Uh, Sonny, uh, when we leave this broadcast, what are you going to do as far as light training is concerned? Well, I do road work and uh, exercise to get my body in shape for the... Who are some of your idols in, in boxing? You certainly must have someone that you'd like to follow or someone that you've honored in your own mind as a great fighter? I would say Joe Lewis. Did you ever see Joe Lewis fight as a champion? Well, I see the uh, movies, not in real life. What's the first heavyweight bout you ever witnessed outside of your own? No, I think it was in the... You never uh, saw any? No. You never saw Braddock fight or Schmeling or... That's even before your time, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, you never saw anybody fight in the early 50s as a heavyweight champion? Well, uh, here's a Charles. As a Charles. And uh, what went through your mind the night you saw him? Did you picture yourself standing there holding the crown someday yourself? Well, no, I never gave it a thought, man. What about Jersey Joe Walcott? Did you ever see him fight? Not in real life. Uh, he was remarkable in one respect. It seems he never had a bruise or a scar or any mark of a fighter. Isn't that true? Yeah, well, I guess that's when he rode the back all the time. Sonny, our time is about up. Is there anything you'd like to tell our viewers just before we formally sign off? Well, it's always a great pleasure to come on your program. Thank you, Sonny. It's a double pleasure for me, and I'm really delighted that you let me interview you, and I know this is the third time that we've met, not in the <laughs> ring. Thank you very much, Mr. Sonny Liston, the heavyweight champion of the world, for giving us such frank and straightforward answers. You've lost none of your wit, and beyond that, I'm sure you haven't lost your punch. Good luck to you and your forthcoming bout with Cassius Clay, and may the best man win. Thank you. We'll be back after this message. It was our pleasure to interview Mr. Sonny Liston, the heavyweight champion of the world. Next week, another interesting guest. Same time, same station. In the meanwhile, thanks for watching and thanks for listening. Good night. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sixteen Russian churchmen are visiting the United States as the guests of the National Council of Churches. Their first stop is in Denver, where they are guest observers at the midwinter business sessions of the National Council's Policymaking General Board. These Russian clergymen are here as part of an exchange agreement 
and the reciprocation of a visit made by a delegation of the National Council of Churches to Russia a year ago. The head of the visiting Russian delegation is in our studios. He is the Archbishop of Yaroslavl and Rostov, a member of the Holy Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church and President of the Department of External Church Affairs of the Moscow Patriarchate. Serving as an interpreter for this interview will be Dr. Paul Anderson, who lived in Russia two years. Dr. Anderson, active in the YMCA movement throughout the world, is a consultant with the National Council of Churches on relations with the Eastern Orthodox Churches in Eastern Europe. Archbishop Nicodem, a young man, has had a brilliant career. His given name was Boris Rotov. He became a monk at the age of 17. In 1957 to 1959, he headed a Russian church mission to Israel. In 1961, he performed a similar function in New Delhi, India. We shall hear from Archbishop Nicodem after this message. Archbishop and Nicodem, are you enjoying your visit to Denver? Denver is a very nice city. Денверский совет церквей нас гостеприимно встречает. У Денвера очень хорошее расположение. Соединение степей и гор. Это очень красиво. Архбишоп Никодим, сколько вам лет? Мне 34-й год. Что мотивировало вас на Призвание быть служителем Церкви Христовой у меня появилось еще в детские годы. Когда мне было 14-15 лет, я уже чувствовал потребность быть служителем Церкви Христовой. И когда мне было 17 лет, я стал служителем церкви. В городе Ярославле, где я теперь архиепископ, покойный архиепископ Дмитрий рукоположил меня в дьякона и постриг в монахи. И с тех пор вот я совершаю там свое служение. Took me in as a monk, and there I am now, the the archbishop. Are there, are there any members, or are there members of the clergy, that belong to the Communist Party? You let them stay in the Duchovenstvo, to to also stay in the Communist Party. Нет, этого быть не может. That could not be. Потому что член Коммунистической партии по уставу этой партии должен быть атеистом. No, because according to the statutes of the Communist Party. Every member must be an atheist. И член клира, естественно, служитель, проповедник всей своей жизнью и словом и делом слова Божие и Господа нашего Иисуса Христа. And each one of the clergy, by his calling and by his task, is to serve, is to is to preach the word of God. Эти две вещи не совместимы. These two things are not compatible. Archbishop Nicodem, what benefits or knowledge do you expect to gain from this trip to the United States? Мы прибыли в Соединенные Штаты, представители шести христианских церквей Советского Союза. We came to United States, the delegation of representing six churches of the Soviet Union. С визитом к Национальному совету церквей Христа Соединенных Штатов Америки. On invitation of the National Council of Churches of the United States, of Christ the United States. Цель нашего визита укрепить наши экуменические связи, укрепить дух экуменического братства, которое имеется между нами. The purpose was to strengthen the ecumenical fellowship between our churches and our people. И церкви, члены Национального совета церквей Христа Соединенных Штатов, и все церкви, представленные в нашей делегации, являются членами Всемирного совета церквей. The churches 
represented uh, by our delegation and the churches of the National Council of Churches, our member of the World Council of Churches. А участвуя во всемирном совете церквей, участвуя в экуменическом движении, мы стараемся приблизить то время, которое заповедано нам самим Господом и Иисусом Христом. Чтобы исполнить Его заповедь, мы стремимся к тому, чтобы быть всем единым. And in uh, our work in the World Council of Churches, both they and we, and the Soviet Union and here, we try to carry out the call, of the, the request of our Lord, that uh, in the end all should be one. В экуменическом движении мы стараемся достичь единства веры, единства жизни и действий. In the ecumenical movement, we try to find unity жизни, both конечно. in our faith and in our life of action. Uh, may I ask this question of uh, Your Grace? Uh, how can the church survive, or is it difficult for the church to survive when the government has so many restrictions on religion in Russia? Обычно, когда задают этот вопрос, то в этом случае смешиваются два понятия. Two, two concepts are mixed up. В нашей стране коммунистическая партия ведет идеологическую борьбу со всякой религией. Country, conducts, uh, но, но правительство не ведет никаких административных мер борьбы ни с какой религией. Премьер нашего правительства Никита Сергеевич Хрущев неоднократно говорил. Что как секретарь Центрального комитета Коммунистической партии, он атеист. Но как премьер правительства он обязан защищать и защищает права верующих граждан. But as the head of the government, the premier of the government, he is obliged by the constitution to maintain the constitution and see that it is carried out. И за исполнением законов о свободе религиозного исповедания в нашей стране. And in the carrying out of the constitutional provision, provision for freedom of religious confession in our country. Специальный правительственный орган. Совет по делам Русской Православной Церкви и другой такой же орган, Совет по делам религиозных культов при Совете Министров СССР, следит и если местные органы власти могут позволить себе когда-то какое-то отклонение от нормы закона, то из центра их поправляют в таких случаях. Uh, may I ask the Archbishop this question? Are Sunday school classes permitted in Russia? Нет, религиозных школ у нас нет. No, we do not have religious schools. Но мы имеем по закону свободу отправления религиозного культа. But we have, according to law, the, the right to conduct religious services, the services of worship. И в это понятие у нас входит церковная проповедь, поскольку and, проповедь неотделимая часть культа. And in that uh, con concept, we have the preaching, which is a part of the conduct of religious services of worship. Поэтому мы стараемся максимально проповедовать. Consequently, we try to the maximum to preach. И нашу проповедь строить таким образом, чтобы она была понятна для людей самого различного возраста. And to make our sermons to be of the kind so as to be intelligible to persons of all ages. И мы можем видеть результат такой проповеди. And we can see the results of such preaching. Что миллионы верующих людей наполняют наши храмы. That uh, millions of the believing people our churches. Oh, Your Grace, may I ask you this question? Since young men and young women are taught to be atheists in schools, and uh, you want to just say that? Uh, I want to finish the question. 
And atheism, of course, is uh, contrary to a belief in God. The atheism taught if it is very vocal. Isn't it difficult for Archbishop Nicodem and others of the clergy to instill a feeling of religion in the young Russian boy or girl? Главным образом, религиозное и наше особенно христианское влияние на молодежь и на более старшие поколения может быть тогда, когда мы являемся проповедниками не только словом, но самой жизнью Евангелия. Если, скажем, молодой человек или девушка, посещая школу, слышат там лекции, или им преподается какой-то предмет в аспекте атеизма, но они имеют возможность прийти в храм, а в храмах мы преподаем христианское учение. They are still free to come to church, and there they get the Christian view. Но когда они слышат христианское учение, когда они слышат учение атеизма, то задача христиан, задача церкви, показать, что христиане самой жизнью своей весьма высоки и что они лучше. И тогда проповедь христианства бывает неотразима. But when they hear, see both the preaching uh, of the church and the, the teaching of atheism. Then they will also observe what happens in the actual life as a result of this. And then they would see that the Christian teaching is of higher quality. Archbishop and Nicodem will return to this interview right after this message. Archbishop Nicodem, a moment ago you made a very interesting statement. You said that the boys and girls in Russia study atheism in public schools, I imagine at least up until the time of the age of 18. Then they are free. Then they are free to go. Then they are free to go to church and visit the clergyman and make comparisons. Now, if these young boys and girls from the time of birth are taught to believe there is no God, or not to believe in God, what do they ask you when they come to church after 18 years of life without God? Yes, they talk about да, но меня господин немножко не понял. Когда наши девочки, мальчики, молодые люди, девушки учатся в школе, то они имеют полную возможность посещать храмы. И посещение храмов у нас не начинается с 18-летнего возраста. Это неправильно. А родители могут приводить своих детей в, школ... в церковь. И сами молодые люди, если имеют желание до 18-летнего возраста, имеют полную возможность посещать церковь. Ну, то, что их интересует. Вопросы религиозные, вопросы, вопросы бытия Божия и все, что связано с христианским учением. Все это их интересует, и на все эти вопросы наше духовенство старается, прежде всего, предусмотреть все эти вопросы и дать на них ответы, прежде чем они будут поставлены. А когда они бывают поставлены, то на них дается исчерпывающий ответ. А вообще в отношении посещения храма, то у нас 
можно наблюдать такую картину лет до 12 до 12 13 дети много посещают большое количество детей посещает храм затем становится их меньше и меньше и уже скажем после 18 летнего возраста когда начинается увлечение техникой, спортом и так далее, до 30-летнего возраста молодежи уже не так много посещает. Активно уже немного посещает храм, но после 30-летнего возраста и дальше с повышением возраста уже больше и больше людей приходит в храмы. Вопрос, который содержит в том, что написал некий известный колумнист. Я уже перевел это. Роскоу Друмманд, один из американских That Premier Khrushchev fears the power of religious conviction more than any other threat to communist rule. The evidence now at hand. Should I repeat that? Go ahead. The evidence now at hand shows mounting activity by the Soviet secret police to curtail the practice of all religions. Сейчас увеличивается активность тайной тайной полиции. Despite the fact, religious. Despite the fact that the Soviet Constitution guarantees freedom of religious and anti-religious propaganda, what is your reaction to this? Despite all that, the Soviet Constitution provided the religious and anti-religious propaganda. Ну, с мнением этого писателя я не согласен, потому что наше общество единое, и верующие, и неверующие, какие составляют наше общество, имеют одни права. И активно используют их. И прежде всего вот мы, верующие люди, служители нашей церкви, мы очень активно используем свои права и используем их таким образом, что церковь Христова в нашей стране не является умирающей. Церковь наша живет, она полна сил, потому что благодать Божия с ней, а служители ее стараются активно действовать в мире. И вот те сведения, какие тут имеются, о повышении какой-то активности против э, церкви, the that they have about the in секретной полиции, в частности. Об этом я ни ничего не могу сказать. Думаю, что это просто точка зрения вот этого писателя. says that anti-Semitism is being widely practiced against the one and a half million Orthodox Jews throughout the Soviet Union. Any comment on that? No, I would also say that that is not true. I think I would also say that that is not true. Неверно потому, что евреи являются равноправными гражданами нашей страны наравне со всеми многими народами нашей страны. Евреи занимают выдающиеся посты во всех сферах деятельности нашего общества. Что касается верующих евреев, 
то они, так же как и православные, так же как и мусульмане, так же как буддисты, могут иметь свои молитвенные здания. И я знаю целый ряд городов, специально я этим вопросом не занимался, но я знаю целый ряд городов, где имеются мечети, и у меня в частности имеются личные мои знакомые раввины. Русская церковь, как и всякая церковь, как всякая религия в нашем государстве, отделена от государства. Поэтому политические вопросы мы не вмешиваемся. Вопросы политики, где церковь активно вмешивалась в них, не приносили ей никогда пользы. Задача церкви и ее служителей строить Царство Божие на земле в сердцах верующих. Крещений очень много, и подавляющее большинство рождающихся младенцев крещены. Правда, не все они становятся активными христианами, когда вырастают. Но крещены подавляющим большинством. Archbishop and Nicodem, aren't you disturbed by the fact that you made the statement when the boys or girls reach the age of 12 or 13 that you lose most of them in the church? That's rather young to lose them, isn't it? Да, она уходит, но я сказал, потом она возвращается. А наша задача – людей всех возрастов призывать в Царство Божие, призывать в Церковь. Я считаю, что мы имеем все возможное, все нам необходимое для того, чтобы нормально функционировали наши церкви. Чтобы они совершали свое служение и свидетельство в мире. And their witness in the world. I'm sorry that uh, we have to conclude this interview, Archbishop Nicodem. Uh, we have many, many more questions we'd like to ask you. We appreciate your coming here. I know that our viewers found your answers, comments, and impressions to be most interesting. We hope you enjoy your stay in the United States. And thanks to Dr. Paul Anderson for being interpreter for this interview, and I'll be back after this message. We'll see you again next week. Good night. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Our guest tonight is the world-renowned evangelist, Dr. Billy Graham. Dr. Graham was born and raised in Charlotte, North Carolina. He received his A.B. degree in 1943 from Wheaton College, Wheaton, Illinois. 
His Doctor of Divinity degree was conferred by King's College in 1948. He was also awarded an LLD degree from Houghton College, Houghton, New York, in 1950. Billy Graham is married and the father of five children. His career as an evangelist, begun in 1946, has made his name a household word throughout the world. He has spoken to more than 29 million people in his crusades, which have carried him to every corner of the globe. Not since the days of Billy Sunday has an American evangelist captured the hearts of so many, many people. We'll talk with Billy Graham in just a moment. Welcome to our show, Billy Graham. Thank you, sir. It's a great privilege to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you, and thank you for accepting, and it's a great honor for us to have you here. Uh, Billy, modern man has often been described as a detached religionist. That is, he does not wholeheartedly embrace the traditional teachings of his forefathers. Is that true? Uh, it's uh, according to whether you're talking about a person in India or Latin America or Africa or the United States. I would say that in the United States, uh, this is partially true. I think that perhaps uh, we are living today in the afterglow of our father's faith. And while we have a great religious renaissance in the United States, I think that perhaps it has not reached the depth that we might like it to reach. Billy, what is your concept of God? Well, my concept of God is found in the scriptures, uh, that God is a holy, uh, unchangeable God, that he's a God of love and mercy and grace, and that he loves us so much that he gave his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. And when I want to see God, I look at Christ, because Christ is the full expression of God. Billy, in your opinion, is there one overriding reason that makes a person say he is an atheist? Uh, I seriously doubt if there are very many true atheists in the world. I noticed when Mr. Khrushchev uh, was in England, he said he was an atheist, but on several occasions he would say, may God have mercy upon you. Then he would laugh and say, of course, I don't believe in God. But when he was here in the United States, he quoted the scriptures quite often in this fashion. On one occasion, he said, as an old Russian saying says, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He was actually quoting the Bible. And uh, I seriously doubt when man uh, is up against it, especially at death, if they're any real atheist. They may rationalize and think they're atheist, but I seriously doubt if they're any real atheist because I think that man basically, innately, believes in God. And if he doesn't have a God, he'll make a God. What would your definition be of a real atheist, if there be such a person? How would you define a real atheist? Well, as I understand, the word atheist uh, is a person who denies faith in God, or any belief in God, or any uh, supernaturalistic concept. Now, the person who says he's an atheist and denies faith in God, to use your phrase, he also, if he's a true atheist, denies the existence of God. Is that true? If he's a true atheist, uh, that would be implied, yes. Now, what about agnosticism? Well, an agnostic, uh, the word agnostic uh, comes from the same word that we get our word ignoramus from. Uh, in other words, a man says, who is an agnostic, I just don't know. Now, Billy, what's the gr goal of a Billy Graham crusade? What's the purpose of a crusade? Uh, the primary purpose of our crusades are to win people to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. In other words, to get men to commit themselves to Christ. Uh, this brings about conversion, and our objective is to get men converted. Christ said, except you be converted and become as little children, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Now, we, uh, uh, the psychiatry and psychology is now coming to the point that they're saying that man needs a conversion experience. Of course, they're talking about on a psychological level. I talked last week with several of the psychiatrists at Harvard University, and uh, several of them were in full agreement that what we were doing was psychologically sound. Well, this is what Christ was saying, except in a deeper spiritual di uh, uh, dimension, that man needs converting. And a British psychiatrist recently said that man is so psychologically constituted that he needs converting. Our primary emphasis is to get men converted. That doesn't mean an emotional experience. That means that he is willing to change from one way of life to another way of life in which now Christ dominates his life. But of course, there are secondary things. For example, 
renewal among the churches is another objective of a crusade. Thirdly, to get an entire town, for example, Denver, talking about religion. Uh, they may be against it, but at least it's, it's an object of discussion, and we feel that when people on the street are talking religion, it has a healthy emphasis on the community. What do you find to be the lasting effects of your crusades concerning those who have made decisions for Christ? Well, if I didn't have absolute documented proof that there was lasting results, I would have uh, taken some other field of service quite a long time ago. But we have a group of men uh, who have made an intensive survey of all the crusades we've ever conducted. Uh, they have now about 12,000 documented cases that have been personally interviewed. And it's one of the most thrilling things uh, that I've ever read. Uh, for example, I was in Scotland last summer. It's been five years since our crusade in Scotland. There are 109 students in all the seminaries of Scotland studying for the ministry from Scotland. Some American students, but from Scotland, 109. 19 of them sent me a letter signed saying we were converted under your ministry when you were here five years ago. Now, it takes about three or four years for a community to feel the impact of these meetings because the, uh, just after a meeting is held is when the criticism comes and they say, where are the lasting effects when the last benediction has been pronounced? But we never hear that criticism five years later because these people have uh, come uh, to take a place of responsibility in the community. Their life has been changed. They now have a new concept of living, but it takes them that time to grow and to find their place in places of spiritual leadership. Now, Billy, what do you think of the marital troubles of Elizabeth Taylor? <laughs> well, I uh, think that she needs our prayers, and uh, it's a very interesting thing that when uh, uh, the woman taken in adultery was brought to Christ, and the woman that had been married seven times was, uh, came to Christ, that he never condemned them. He never pointed an accusing finger. In fact, uh, he, he pointed to the Pharisees and he said, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. But he did try to lead them and did successfully lead them to a knowledge of, of himself. And this transformed and changed their lives. And he said to the woman taken in adultery, Go and sin no more. This indicates that he offers a power and a new capacity for living, a new capacity for happiness. And this is what makes Christianity distinctive from Islam and Hinduism and all these other religions. He offers a capacity to live the Christian ethic. And I would say to Elizabeth Taylor that this is a spiritual search that she apparently has on, hoping that a new husband, hoping that something else is going to bring peace of mind and happiness and joy. I'd like to tell her that Christ can give it to her, that all that she's been searching for all of her life and have, has not found she can find in Jesus Christ, and I hope that someday that will take place. Well, pursuing that subject a bit further, do you think the wave of publicity about Elizabeth Taylor will in any way affect the morals or standards of the youth of this country? I suspect that, uh, there's a, that many people are getting a bit disgusted with it all, and it may have uh, the reverse reaction than perhaps we might think. But I would like to say that the emphasis that we have placed upon sex goddesses in this country, in my opinion, is an indication of the decadence uh, that we have at work in this country that, it, to me, is very frightening. Well, now, this emphasis on sex goddesses that you just mentioned, would you put the blame mainly on Hollywood and the motion picture producers and I directors? think it's, uh, no, I think it's a combination of everything. I think we, as the American public, are, are just as responsible because this, apparently, is what we're eating up. Uh, whether it be in films, or whether it be in the press, or whether it be in our magazines, they couldn't stay in business if they were not patronized. And if you want to uh, pack a, a, a movie house today, put adults only on it. And so then I would say running. it's a combination. And I think that it is, of course, uh, a, sani a satanic attack upon the morals of this country. I don't think that this country can possibly exist if the moral strength is eaten out. I think this book... Uh, entitled uh, Every War Safe One, which is an, uh, um, uh, the Army's an psychological analysis of the American prisoners of war is one of the most revealing things that happened in Korea. And uh, the, uh, this frightens our military uh, leaders today. Well, this moral decadence you speak of, uh, when did you 
When do you think it first began to flourish in this country? Is it 10 years old, 50 years old? Well, it old? first began to flourish with Adam and Eve. Well, when did it reach its <laughs> present uh, heights in our time? Uh, I think perhaps that the man's heart has always been the same since the days of Adam and Eve. We are always sinful. But uh, in recent years, because of mass media of communication, uh, because of population increase, uh, and uh, uh, all of these other factors have entered into making this, I think, uh, on a, uh, a national scale such as we've never known before. But I think our hearts have been sinful all along, and we need redemption, and this is why Christ came. And this is what Holy Week is all about. Billy Lewis Cassells has written an interesting magazine article entitled The Rightest Crisis in Our Churches, in which he says a tide of disunity is sweeping the church with extreme rightists performing a disservice in the name of being militantly anti-communist. What is your reaction to that statement? Well, I uh, read the article, and Lewis Cassells is a great friend of mine. Uh, but uh, I am not a member of any rightist group or left-wing group for that matter. I simply call myself a Christian trying to follow Christ, and I have not allowed labels to be attached to me. Uh, I, I uh, would not want to comment further because uh, this is in a political area, and uh, I have never felt that, uh, that God wanted me uh, to lead an anti-communist crusade. I believe my job is to preach the gospel and to live the gospel, and at this point I agree with Bishop Fulton Sheen. He said, our job is not to be anti-communist primarily. Our job is to live the Christian faith. And I agree with Bishop Sheen at this point. I think he's quoted uh, in this particular article. What would you say is the greatest strength of Christianity today? Well, the greatest strength of Christianity today is the Bible. Because without the Bible, we would have no knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we would not have a full revelation of God. And uh, uh, this is why I believe we need a return to the authority of the Scriptures. I think one of the great uh, uh, faults of the church today is our doubting that this is God's revealed Word. And because of this, uh, this has led to many doubts, particularly among our young people today. I have just been on various university and college campuses giving lectures and holding discussions, and I met this issue time after time. Can these scriptures be relied upon? I believe they can, but I don't believe they can be proven. Paul was writing to the Corinthians, and he said the Greeks are seeking for an intellectual panacea, but he said you won't find it, because he said the power of God is in the cross, and I cannot prove the scriptures. In fact, I can't even prove the existence of God in a test tube, but I accept them by faith. I accept God by faith. I accept the Bible by faith. And uh, this has given me uh, a joy and a peace and a security. Now some student uh, says, well, isn't that an escapism? Yes, in a sense it is, but certain types of escapisms, all psychologists will agree, are good. We need certain types of escapisms. Uh, it's when we try to escape from reality and try to escape from our problems uh, by artificial means that we're in trouble. But the escapism to the uh, to, to the authority, for example, of, uh, of the uh, uh, mathematical uh, uh, formulas uh, and the table of, uh, uh, what do we call, searching for a word at the moment, uh, where two plus two is four and so forth. That is an escapism for the mathematician or the physicist. Billy will continue this discussion right after this message. Billy, what's your opinion of the John Birch Society? Well, I do not know that I have ever met a member of the John Birch Society. Perhaps I have, but I don't know that I have. And uh, uh, while some of the th people, I'm sure, are very sincere people, I certainly cannot agree uh, with the positions that have been taken by the president or the founder, Mr. Welch, uh, of the John Birch Society. I think when you begin calling uh, President Eisenhower and people of that sort uh, as uh, insincere or perhaps even giving them the connotation of being uh, communist sympathizers, I think this is all wrong. I have had the privilege of knowing Mr. Eisenhower and some of those that have been named, and I know their sincere dedication uh, to this country. Billy, each person himself 
can't speak for everyone, but this is probably true. Each person himself who follows a particular religion faithfully believes that his religion is the one true religion. What is your reaction to that? Uh, that is not altogether true. Uh, I think if uh, you uh, talk to people of other religions, they're not quite as definite. Buddha said at the end of his life, for example, I'm still searching for truth. Christ made the astounding declaration, I am the truth. In other words, Christ said, I'm the embodiment of all truth. Now, either he is the embodiment of all truth, or he's one of the biggest liars and frauds and charlatans in history. And this is one of the things I had to wrestle with when I came to Christ, and I made that decision by faith again and accepted him. And he said that he is the only way to the Father. So here we have the uniqueness and the exclusiveness of Christianity. People say that's rather narrow. I came into the airport uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, the pilot is a friend of mine. I've known him for 17 years. And he came back and we talked a while and we talked about procedures of coming in on a fast jet into airports and how narrow-minded these pilots have to be. We took off from Baltimore this morning and it was pouring rain and the ceiling was low. I was glad the pilot was narrow said that the kingdom of heaven, uh, the gate to the kingdom of heaven is narrow. And I have accepted his terms and am uh, and, and going through that gate. And it may be considered narrow in this age of tolerance and broad-mindedness, but I'm going to continue on the narrow road. Billy, you're still a very young man. You've had a very oh, exciting you. life. <laughs> and you've talked to millions of people. What was your own personal reaction the first time you addressed a large crowd, a crowd that you never thought you would ever stand before and talk to so many thousands? What was the effect within you? Well, uh, Max, I think, where was uh, I think that the, uh, uh, let's see, the, the largest crowd that I ever addressed, the first real large one, was in Boston in 1950. And uh, the reaction was no different than it is now. I was nervous, and uh, as Paul said uh, to the Corinthians, I was shaky and weak and fearful and dependent upon God, and I did a great deal of praying and preparation. And uh, I went out in all of my weakness and just had to ask God to help me because I'm just a farm boy from uh, North Carolina and uh, I did not feel that I was qualified uh, intellectually or in uh, speaking ability or any other way to cope with these crowds. And why they began to come was a mystery to me uh, because I uh, never intended to do this sort of work at all. And yet it just developed. What and why it has continued so long has been also an amazement to me because uh, people said it would last a year, maybe two or three years, and then it would be forgotten. But it has continued and it has moved to every continent and almost every country. You, say, interest. you say you never intended to do this work. What no. work did you intend to do? Uh, I intended to be in Christian service. And I intended first to be a pastor. And then I went from there to be the president of a small uh, Bible school in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I thought that perhaps my work would continue along that line in, uh, in a combination of evangelism and education. But by 1952, this had developed and I had to make a choice. So I resigned my work there and went into evangelism on a full-time scale. And at the time I went in to evangelism, uh, religion was on the back pages of the newspapers. Very rarely did they ever give it big play as they do today. Any kind of religious event, it's hard for us to realize that that's been only 12 years ago. And uh, secondly, emotionalism, uh, large amounts of money, all of these things were, con were, were connected with this type of evangelism. People had the image of Elma Gantry. And I decided, with the help of God, that I was going to do everything I could uh, to help bring about a new image in evangelism. And I've lived to see the day that almost every major denomination in the United States has its committee on evangelism, its division of evangelism. Almost every seminary has its chair of evangelism. This was not true 12 years ago. Billy, do you believe that a potential nuclear war can be fo forestalled or avoided by prayer alone? Uh, in fact, I think that is the only way it will be forestalled. Uh, I think that uh, if we continue on our present course, that we are on now a collision course. And I think that we will have this nuclear holocaust unless God intervenes. But I believe God's going to intervene. Because nowhere in the Bible is a book of the future. It's a book of prophecy. And nowhere does it indicate that man is going to destroy himself. Man is going to go through some terrible times. Uh, but God is going to intervene in history. 
and we believe that Christ is coming back and going to set up his kingdom. The Bible does say in the third chapter of 2 Peter that the world is going to be burned up. But one of the elements of, of fire is cleansing. And I believe God's going to cleanse the earth of all evil and all wickedness. And the kingdom of God is going to prevail. And that's the reason I don't believe that Mr. Khrushchev is going to write the last chapter of history. I think God's going to write it. And I don't think history is on the side of the communist. I think history is on God's side. Billy, in the interest of time to draw out as much information from you as possible, I know you've met and dined with many world-famous figures. Could you give us a capsule impression of some names? Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> well, she is a most charming and wonderful person who carries the weight of a great part of the world upon her shoulders. Every single day of my life, I pray for Her Majesty the Queen. Winston Churchill. Uh, when I had the privilege of uh, meeting Mr. Churchill, I had the impression of a man at the end of life who was Mr. History himself, but still at the end of life, searching for some very basic spiritual truths. Dwight D. Eisenhower. One of the great men that I have had the privilege of knowing. Uh, a man that I think is as sincere and as dedicated as any man that I ever knew. President Kennedy. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, I have not known as well. I have played golf with him. Uh, I got the impression of a tremendous competitor. He keeps the score himself. He doesn't even give a putt that long. And uh, a man that I think has the potential of making a great president. What does he shoot, or is that a secret? That is, I think, classified. <laughs> he kept the score, and I really never found out. That I heard he's a low handicapper, so one might guess what area he shoots. Well, low is always a relative term. <laughs> well, I hear he's a handicapper. Might be below 10, but I'm not sure of that. It could be. So he might shoot in the high 70s. Anyway, Nehru. Uh, Mr. Nehru, uh, I believe, is partially mystic. Uh, I think that he is probably privately pessimistic about the world situation. At least I get that impression. What do you find to be the biggest internal problem you have to cope with in conveying your views on religion to the people of this country? Uh, indifference, uh, materialism. Uh, we have become a materialistic nation. And uh, we are so taken up with things. We want a little religion thrown in. We, we don't want to do away with religion. We like to salve our conscience a bit. But materialism, I think, is the greatest problem we face in communicating the gospel. We're getting a signal. We only have a minute left. Could you tell us your plans for future crusades? Yes, our, our here? next uh, major crusade will be in Chicago beginning May 30th uh, at McCormick Place in Soldier Field. We hope to come to Denver sometime in the future. Uh, we have no plans. I don't know when that will be. We are meeting with some clergymen while we're here to discuss it. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Billy Graham, for coming here and favoring us with your presence for this interview. You didn't appear nervous to us or shaking or any of those other <laughs> qualities you mentioned. You look calm and magnetic. We want to wish you continued success in your forthcoming crusades and in all your work. Thank you, sir. I'll be back in a moment. We want to thank Dr. David Hood, Mr. Stan Mooneyham, and Mr. Ed Erickson, and other evangelical leaders for making this interview possible. Our guest tonight was the world-famous Billy Graham, renowned evangelist. We'll see you again next week at the same time on this station. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, the tables are going to be turned. You'll notice I'm sitting in a different seat tonight, occupying the chair where our guest usually sits. In my seat is the man who's going to conduct the interview, my sponsor, Mr. Gordon Roberts, president of Stearns Dairy, which sells all of its products directly to the home. Mr. Roberts is a distinguished citizen besides being a leader in the dairy field. He has written numerous articles on various subjects and is intensely interested in the fields of science and semantics. He belongs to a number of community organizations and has received several major awards for his contributions to civic betterment. This August, there will be a general semantics conference on the West Coast in which it is hoped that countries from both sides of the Iron Curtain will be represented, particularly to discuss the same words that have different meanings in different countries. It will be the first such conference ever held. Mr. Roberts has been invited to attend this conference as a member of the Board of Trustees of the Institute of General Semantics. When it comes to making a person think, probe, analyze, and respond, 
There are few things in the world which can cause as much mental stimulation as participating in a session of semantics. We also want to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Roberts for sponsoring us over such a long period and for making these programs possible. Our interview will start right after this message. Well, Gordon, you've got a chance to practice on me tonight in preparation for those visiting semanticists whom you are going to tangle with in August. Incidentally, we want to congratulate you upon being invited to attend this very important session. Uh, if you're ready to fire away, go ahead. Okay, I will. Is there any characteristically different way that men and women respond to an interview? No, I think that they both respond equally alike. Uh, when a woman is alert in her own right, she's just as responsive and as intelligent and as interesting as a man is, except, of course, a woman will use female characteristics of speech when she talks, and a man will use male characteristics. I interviewed, I'm sorry to uh, recall this tragic moment, Linda Darnell, who we read uh, died from these unfortunate injuries she received when she had third-degree burns. I had her on and Jane Wyman, and uh, both were very responsive and intensely interesting, talking about their motion picture careers. Besides, they were very pretty. Yes. Well, that brings up another question. Uh, by the way, who would you say would be the most famous or interesting woman? I, I know you couldn't give an unequivocating answer to that, but uh, answer is... Well, uh, maybe the most uh, well-known woman uh, for her act that I interviewed is Tempest Storm. But I would say that the most interesting woman that I had on the air was Jane Wyman. She was radiant. She projected like she did in motion pictures, even though she was a star a number of years before. Her eyes were very expressive and very bright, and she made a big hit that night. Well, now I'll get you back in good graces in your own home, Max. Uh, outside of Miriam, your wife, who was the most beautiful? Well, you know, my wife comes first, and uh, even though I say this one is the most beautiful, I'll still have to rate my wife first, uh, Jane Wyman. Well, that's a, that's a good answer. I, I don't think that can get you in any trouble. Uh, now let's shift around a little bit. Compare Max Baer and Sonny Liston as subjects for an interview. Well, those two uh, men were as different as uh, day and night. Uh, Max Baer, as you know, died a few years ago. Max Baer had a terrific sense of humor. He came here one evening and there was one joke after another. He, I thought he was the best ad libber that I ever had as far as a fighter is concerned, even better than many of the comedians. Sonny Liston, as we know, is very reticent. And uh, it's very difficult to make him speak if he'll say a few words. Why, that, of course, is tantamount to a whole page. But uh, who was the funniest man you'd say that you ever interviewed? Well, I've interviewed a number of comedians, but I think uh, the most responsive comedian I ever interviewed was Henny Youngman. Now, some comedians appear in nightclubs. They come here to Denver. They're paid handsomely for their act. And you ask them to give them some of the material, and they say, oh, well, we don't do that on television. We just talk. But Henny Youngman actually gave his whole act on the program. Remember any jokes? Oh, uh, Henny? Yeah, I remember <laughs> a few of his jokes. Uh, he said, uh, I was an atheist, but I gave it up. No holidays. <laughs> he said, in this country, there is a trend for those who have been married 25 or 30 years to get divorced. He says, uh, I've been married to the same woman for 38 years. He says, tell me, where have I failed? <laughs> Another time he was in a small town and he wanted to look up an attorney and he came across a law firm called Hirsch, 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 and Hirsch, four Hirsches. So he picked up the phone and dialed and he says, hello, is Mr. Hirsch there? And the boy said, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Hirsch is sick. He hung up and dialed again. Is Mr. Hirsch there? He says, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Hirsch has gone to Europe. Hung up and dialed again. He says, hello, is Mr. Hirsch there? He says, no, he's out playing golf. He hung up and dialed again. He says, hello, is Mr. Hirsch there? Speaking. <laughs> Another time he told her a little line about, he said, in this country, a woman gives birth to a child every five minutes. He says, we've got to find that woman and stop her. One more little line, then I'll be through talking about Henny. He's always sending me jokes. <laughs> Sent me a note from Miami Beach, Florida. He says, I'm staying in a hotel that is so exclusive that even room service has an unlisted number. <laughs> well, I'm going to shift a little bit and get off to uh, some uh, more... Uh, uh, well-known figures, even in comedians. Uh, <clears throat> who is the most controversial person as an, indiv inter as an individual that uh, you might say you ever interviewed? I mean, not with regard to the uh, background uh, of causes or anything, but just controversial as a person. 
Well, there are two people I'd say that easily fall in that category, Jimmy Hoffa and Governor Wallace. Uh, what, uh, what kind of impression did these uh, men make on you? And well, Jimmy Hoffa and Governor Wallace both made very good television subjects. Jimmy Hoffa, of course, uh, was having his vendetta then with uh, Bob Kennedy and the late President Kennedy and perhaps all the Kennedys. And I had interviewed him on that question. He withheld nothing. He lambasted the Kennedys. He gave them no quarter. No one had to wonder where he stood or whether what they read in the paper was true. Governor Wallace, of course, came here, and I tried to prod from him his exact position on where he stood on segregation and integration. And I think that uh, I succeeded to a large extent, although he evaded a couple of questions. Governor Wallace is a very articulate person. He has a good command of English. He has good diction, and uh, he knows how to express himself. Yes, well, Wallace, I don't know anything about. I know that... Uh as far as our company is concerned, dealing with the Central States Conference of Teamsters, they have been meticulously honest in their relations with us. There's been You're never about Jimmy Hoffa now? Jimmy Hoffa, the Teamsters yeah, Union? Yeah. There's never been any indication there of anything in dealing with us that was not absolutely straight. Well, that right reminds there. me of Jimmy Hoffa. My just had a footnote here that's interesting. I had Jimmy Hoffa on the air twice, thanks to the cooperation of the heads of the local Teamsters Union. The second time when he was scheduled to come to Denver, one of the officials here in Denver called me up and arranged for the interview. And I took him at his word, as I do everybody else, set the time for him to come here and announce it in the paper. And three days before, the same man who booked him for me the first time and who delivered Hoffa said, I'm sorry, he says, Jimmy Hoffa can't appear on the air with you. I says, why, isn't he coming to Denver? He says, no, he's coming to Denver. I says, well, what's wrong? He says, well, one of his top assistants just don't want him to go on. I said, well, I don't understand that. Jimmy Hoffa thanked me for being on the air, and regardless of all his troubles, I think he enjoyed being on the air with me. I said, what's the name of his top executive? And he gave it to me. And I called him up, and this fellow started to uh, spar around with me. In effect, he was saying no. He says, well, Jimmy is tired. When he comes there, he's under great pressure. And I says, then does Jimmy Hoffa know that you're speaking for him and canceling his interview? And he evaded that question. I said, I just can't understand it. I said, of course, it's his prerogative not to go in there if he doesn't want to. I said, but I took the man's word from Denver, and we already have an item in the Denver Post, and which was true. I just happened to buy that edition of the paper, and there was an item in Dale Carnes' column which, was, which said Jimmy Hoffa would be on the air. And I told him about it. He says, will you read that again, please? And I read it to him. He said, it's in the Denver Post? I says, yes, it is. He says, well, he says, maybe he can go on the air, and... Thanks to Del Carnes, who's given me a lot of plugs, uh, he may not even know this, that he was responsible for my second date with Jimmy Hoffa. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had him on. Isn't he the one that gave us a plug on the regard to this show? Who was that in the, in the, uh, in the paper? That uh, Del Carnes, yes. He yes. gave us a plug the other well, day. We had to give, to give him turn. a plug at this point. Should we not? We're happy to reciprocate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, whom would you classify as the most uh, famous personage? Uh, from your point of view that you've ever interviewed? Well, there's no question that the most famous person I interviewed was the late President John F. Kennedy, the late, great, revered president. If I may take a moment or two to recall the drama that surrounded that broadcast, uh, I'd like to do that. Is that all right with you? Certainly, certainly. It's, uh, well, you're it the one that's doing it. You're the sponsor. Well, it was know. in 1960, <laughs> Gordon. No, you're very, very nice. It was 1960, and I think it was in April, and we had a heavy snow on the ground that night. And I was scheduled to uh, meet him here about 9.30. I was on the air 10.30 that night. I came in the studios at 9 o'clock, all excited, with great anticipation to meet John Kennedy, who then was a candidate for president. That was the year he was nominated, and he was hot on the road seeking the nomination, trying to wrap up delegates all over the United States. Well, 9.30 came, and the switchboard operator said to me, there's a call for you. And I answered the call, and it's long distance. And a voice said, are you Max Goldberg? I said, yes. You're supposed to have John Kennedy on the air tonight? And I said to myself, oh, that's the end. Here it is, 9.30 and long distance. I said, that's right. He says, well, uh, John Kennedy is in Cheyenne right now. <laughs> Which, of course, <laughs> made me perspire. I says, well, he said, well, we'll be there in time. We got an hour yet. I says, you're in Cheyenne now? I says, when are you leaving? He says, right now. And I says, is it snowing in Cheyenne? He says, yes. I says, there's an awful blizzard here. He says, don't worry about it. We hung up, and I thanked him, and uh, I never thought he'd show. Sure enough, at 10 after 10, four men come trooping in the 
doors of KLZ TV, John Kennedy, John Dolan, Pierre Salinger, and Byron White. And they were as nonchalant as though they just came from across the street where they had a cup of coffee. And I was all out of breath, panting and waiting, and I said, uh, how did you get here so quick? Uh, they said, why, uh, we just got here. I said, I don't understand it. Uh, what time did your plane land at Stapleton Airport? The uh, ground is covered with snow and ice. They said, oh, about 10 minutes ago. I said, how did you get down here in 10 minutes? Said, well, we got down here. Anyway, we all exchanged pleasantries, and the interview began. And before the interview was about eight or nine minutes old, the president himself injected the Catholic issue. I can't remember just how he got around to it, but he himself brought it up and spent most of the time on this question. And I think that this was one of the first shows in America in which the Catholic question, which became perhaps the major campaign issue, was analyzed on this program. When the show was over, uh, Pierre Salinger says, uh, that was a good interview. He said, uh, very fine, very fine. I says, who are you? He says, Pierre Salinger. Well, that didn't mean anything to me then because Pierre was completely unknown. And it's ironic that uh, this late great president of ours about whom so much has been written and will go down in history and who's idolized by the world over is now uh, in his eternal resting place and the other three men, Byron White, is on the Supreme Court of the United States. Pierre Salinger was his press secretary and LBJ's press secretary and was just defeated for the U.S. Senate. And Joe Dolan, who was first assistant to Attorney General Bob Kennedy, is now the administrative assistant to U.S. Senator Robert Kennedy. Of course, that was a very memorable time for me and something that I will never, never forget. The president was magnetic, handsome, his eyes sparkled, his voice was resonant. You could just see that here was a man who was going places, even though at that time the election was still months away. Now, not comparing this man with the president, although in many ways he can be compared to him in an entirely different field, another great man was Billy Graham, the great evangelist. Billy Graham was on the show and he was extremely accommodating and extremely responsive. I have corresponded with Billy a few times, not lately, and I think when he comes to Denver, he's going to hold a crusade here this August, I believe, I think he'll go on the air again with me. We're getting a signal now, uh, Gordon, and we'll be right back with the questions and answers right after this message. Well, Max, uh, you mentioned knowing Billy Graham and many of these people. Uh, I'm admir I've admired from a distance, but never got to know. Of all these famous people, uh, whom have you known the longest of anyone you've ever interviewed? Well, there's no question that uh, I think this is indisputable. The person I've probably known the longest is Jack Dempsey. I met Jack Dempsey in 1928 in Salt Lake City. Now, my brother, who was not a professional fighter only for perhaps a few months and who only weighed about 105 pounds. I don't know whether that's bantamweight or paperweight. He and Jack Dempsey grew up together and Jack used to use him for timing. And when Jack was at the peak of his career, he got a hold of my brother, whose name is Willie, and he said to him, let's go a few rounds. And my brother said to him, well, what if uh, you forget that you're using me for timing? He says, I won't be around. He says, I won't forget. And he did spar with them, and they were lifelong friends, and they still are today. Well, across from my brother's business in Salt Lake City, I saw a huge, huge crowd one day, and I says to my brother Willie, I said, what's that crowd over there? He said, well, Jack Dempsey's across the street. I said, Jack Dempsey? My heart was pounding and palpitating. I was dying to meet him. I says, uh, do you know Jack? I didn't know that time. I well, I knew him. He says, sure, I know him. I says, will you take me over to meet him? He says, certainly. I walked across the street, gave him a big, warm greeting, and I met Jack then. And uh, we've had many uh, wonderful experiences together. It would take a long, long time. One time in 1931, after I left Salt Lake City, I went to Los Angeles. I was dying to go to San Francisco. I'd never been there. And I read in the paper that Jack Dempsey was stopping at the Barber Hotel, which he owned then, that he was going to San Francisco. So I called up Jack, and I said, Jack, I said, this is Max. And he knew me, and uh, he was very friendly. I said, uh, I read you're going to San Francisco. He says, yes. He says, do you want to come along? I says, are you kidding? He says, no. He says, meet me tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock. And that's all he said and hung up. I didn't know whether he meant it, he was serious, or he was just joking, but I couldn't sleep all night. 5 o'clock in the morning, I was there pacing up and down in front of the Barber Hotel. Sure enough, at 6, 
A long Cadillac drove up that the fans of Toledo, Ohio, had given him an appreciation of him winning the title July 4th, 1919 in Toledo. And he says, hello, drop it. He says, come on in, just as though everything were set. And I went in the car and I sat in the back seat. And there were about 20 suitcases. There were only two people in the car, Dempsey and myself. And we drove all the way to San Francisco. And as we were driving, we'd pass a certain spot. He'd say, uh, there's where Mabel Norman lives. There's where Will Rogers lives. There's Malibu Beach, pointed out all the sites like a guide. About 70 miles from San Francisco, he says, uh, you don't have a hat on, do you? I said, no. He says, you better get a hat. He said, uh, San Francisco, uh, they like you better if you wear hats. He says, I don't have a hat either. He says, we'll stop and we'll buy a hat. So we stopped in the haberdashery store and we walked in and the clerk's chins dropped when Jack walked in there and they waited on him hand and foot. And Jack was extremely liberal in those days. I think the two hats cost about ten dollars they were much cheaper than they are today and he gave the fellow fifty dollars he said keep the change so we got back in the car and resumed our ride to san francisco and about 40 miles out of san francisco a speed cop came along blew the whistle you know how these speed cops are they don't even look at the driver he drove right up to the back of the uh, cadillac and he wrote down the license plate and handed jack the ticket and as he handed the ticket he looked up and he says oh you Jack Dempsey, the fighter? Jack says, yes. <laughs> he says, you know you were speeding. Jack says, I guess I was. Jack didn't argue with him or throw his weight around, and the fellow tore up the ticket. He says, well, Jack, he says, the um, captains are watching us. He says, and there's a big drive on for safety. Watch yourself. And so we kept going. And this Cadillac was the kind of a car that could just roll along at 70 miles an hour. You'd think you were going 20. 15 miles out of San Francisco, the same thing happened. He got another ticket. It's practically repeated the first conversation. He didn't deny it and tore up the ticket. I just saw Jack here last week and had a nice visit uh, at Eddie Bone's Pig and Whistle, and I interviewed Jack on tape for an hour. And so those are some of the highlights of my memories with Jack Dempsey, who was a great, great guy. Well, those are wonderful memories to have. I wish I had some of those. Uh, those are wonderful things to think back about. And I know that you... Uh, You've had many experiences of this kind, and many people envy you. I know I do personally. Thank you. <laughs> Incidentally, speaking of professional men outside of uh, boxing or fighting, who would you say was the most uh, colorful professional man that you ever met? Do you mean in the field of politics or any field and outside any, of fighting? Anything that might be described as a professional well, man. I think, Doctor, uh, lawyer, merchant. I think one of the most merchant. colorful men that I have met that I got a tremendous bang out of was Senator Wayne Morse. Senator Wayne Morse I would nominate as the most outspoken guest I've ever interviewed, and there isn't even a close second. He sat down with me one night, and I didn't know the senator too well, and any question I asked him, he had the answer immediately. And once he said there, he says, you know, Max, he says, uh, I've made a lot of enemies in the Senate. And he said, uh, but I don't care. He said, if all the senators would say on the floor of the Senate what they say in the confines of the committee rooms, we'd have a much better government. And that remark was uh, caused right after he practically lacerated President Eisenhower when we discussed him, who was president of the United States at the time, and Senator Wayne Morris was in violent disagreement with him disagreement with him on several issues. Uh, I think Senator Wayne Morris has the unique distinction of the only senator who ever lived who changed parties while he was in the Senate and still managed to stay in the Senate and be elected by both parties. I might be wrong, but I don't think anyone else has ever accomplished that. I think there was a senator from Nebraska way back that did that same thing. And changed and was yeah. re-elected? I'm not sure whether he was re-elected well, or not. Well, I could be wrong, but uh, this there can't be more than one or two in the history of this whole country. Well, it's very, it's very unique, I know that, and I'm probably talking uh, out of turn on this. Uh, no, I don't think he did get re-elected. Uh, I think he switched from Republican to Democrat, or went in as an independent, and uh, did not get re-elected. Of course, another person in that category, I think, that would easily qualify is Adlai Stevenson. Adlai Stevenson, the great wit and the great... Mm -hmm. public speaker and uh, one of the most learned men in the history of this country. By the way, when I asked you about a professional man, I thought you'd come up with a gambler. Uh, I, well, I was a little uh, surprised by your question. Now, <laughs> now that you uh, give me a hint, uh, my mind is rolling back to about four years ago when I interviewed Wilbur Clark, who I think, I don't know if he still heads the desert in or not, but he was the top man there. And the uh, remarkable thing about Wilbur Clark was he came here with a wristwatch 
which was uh, set in the way of a royal flush. And the wristwatch was covered with diamonds. Mm -hmm. Ace, king, jack, king, queen, and a ten, all hearts. And I think that little diamond wristwatch must have cost them, I don't know, ten or $25,000. And the cameramen here did wonderful work. They dollied right in on it, and people still talk about it. And we had a very provocative discussion that night uh, upon the chances of people who go to gamble in Las Vegas and what the advantages of the house are. And I think he said the, the percentage was only two point something or four point, but it was certainly enough, certainly big enough today to take care of all the beautiful girls and all these shows that are imported from France and all the entertainment and leave perhaps thousands or million dollars in the coffers of the owners of the casinos. I imagine the millions, all right. By the way, to switch over completely uh, to a uh, subject that uh, is uh, capturing the imagination, or has captured the imagination of the American public at this time, you've met uh, both Martin uh, Luther King and uh, Dick Gregory, the comedian. Uh, how would you compare these two men? Well, there's no question that both men are champions in their own right, and in their own way, they're both giving of their talents to advance the cause of civil rights. The work of Dr. Martin Luther King, the tremendous esteem with which he is held, a recent winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, the man who advocates advancing the cause of integration through nonviolence. And incidentally, I interviewed Dr. Martin Luther King on this program twice. Thanks to you again for sponsoring and make it possible. And uh, he made a tremendous hit on this show. He's smooth, he's frank, He's candid, he's revealing, he's dispassionate in his delivery, he's unlike what his image might be from reports in the papers from those who've never met him. Dick Gregory, on the other hand, is a fascinating comedian. I think Dick Gregory is a college graduate. He's quick as lightning and extremely outspoken. And Dick Gregory has lost a number of his engagements for speaking out for the Negro cause and for the cause of integration all over the country on the Johnny Carson show and the Jack Parr show, and he doesn't care. Dick Gregory is a very able person. Well, now, uh, I don't know where we are on time, but I rather imagine we're getting along toward We've got the about eight minutes or so. Uh, end here, but uh, uh, there are a couple more questions I'd like to ask, getting back to politics. You've interviewed Adlai Stevenson, and he was a candidate for president. Uh, what kind of a president would you uh, say that he would have made had he been elected? Well, I think Adlai Stevenson would have made a very able president, a wonderful president. Uh, his grasp of international affairs, his education, his uh, conviction on matters that affect the destiny of this country and the destiny of the world are all self-evident. I think Adlai would have made a great president. Uh, I think also, too, that one of his greatest assets was his downfall, the ability to be so quick with an ad lib, the ability to be so witty. And I think a lot of people, in effect, placed in the same categories may be Jack Benny. Well, Jack Benny's a great comedian, but no one has nominated Jack Benny yet to be president of the United States. And a lot of people analyze Stevenson and wonder, well, maybe this fellow is just a little too smart in that respect. Now, I could be wrong, but I think that cost him a lot of votes. He perhaps should have exercised more restraint in his campaigning and a little less humor. Well, you're <coughs> being outspoken enough that I will ask you a question that uh, I would otherwise have hesitated to ask. Uh, you've interviewed a number of people. Uh, who do you think will be the next Republican candidate for president? Well, I don't know who will be the next Republican candidate for president, but I'll tell you who I think would make a fine candidate, even though his marriage uh, probably will keep him out of the nomination that's governor nelson rockefeller i interviewed the governor here uh, he's a very charming person the, the rockefeller name is associated with one who's given millions to all the worthy causes in the country and to help the negro and to help the people that are poverty ridden and so forth we're getting a signal here i don't know whether he'll be nominated but he'd be a very good nominee and a strong one well thank you uh, gordon for uh, turning the tables on us tonight. I certainly appreciate your taking over the chair this evening. I want to thank you and Stearns Dairy again for making the show possible. We hope that you people will continue to buy Stearns Dairy products because that's one way that the income comes to them to pay for this show to make these programs possible. Also, thanks again for appearing here. Uh, you once whispered something to me. What was that you were whispering there? Well, I said something about, uh, you know, sponsors. 
What was that you just said? Stern's Dern. Oh, Stern's Dern. It sounded like something else. <laughs> well, thanks very much, and we'll be right back after this message. <laughs> Thanks again to you, Mr. Gordon Roberts. I really appreciate it. Well, Next week, another interesting guest. You want to say something? Go ahead. No, 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 no. I thought we were all done. Well, we just got a few seconds. <laughs> Next week, another interesting guest. Same time, same station. In the meanwhile, thanks for watching and thanks for listening. Good night. <laughs>